As we reflect on the prevalence of idolatry as being human is really what we're talking about. I, idolatry lives in every corner of the earth. Wherever there is a human, there's a temptation for idol making. Welcome back to the Pastor Talk podcast. We're excited today to kick off a new series here at First Prez, and we're excited to uh, take a turn down the road that maybe is a little bit uh, more lighthearted. We know uh, that the last few series uh, that we have been on uh, have been very heavily focused since the beginning of the year on self-reflection. Of course, with that series where we were working on a spiritual checkup and asking ourselves a question of how our faith is, uh, certainly I want to encourage you to take a look at that if that's of interest. But then over the Lenten series, we looked at the seven deadly sins. Once again, another great spiritual tool. So we're seeking to live out our faith, but also incredibly reflective and incredibly uh, humbling to look at the reality and truth of ourselves and our spirits. And so uh, today we're going to be kicking off a new series. And in this, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about some of the things that uh, behind the scenes uh, may sometimes drive pastors a little crazy. And I want to be clear that uh, we're not going to just uh, spend a series complaining, uh, at least we don't intend to, uh, but we want to spend a little bit of time maybe uh, looking at some things that may not uh, first come to mind for folks when they think about the challenges of being pastor or the maybe more rightly said the challenges of leading a community of faith because uh, there's some things that maybe are obvious, they kind of stick out and they're clear, but in the day-to-day of working with folks, of seeking to try to be faithful and hold up the Word of God in the midst of community, there are some roadblocks that seem to come up semi-regularly, and some of them you may anticipate, some of them may be new to you, um, but this series is going to be devoted to uh, talking about some of them. Yeah, so what we're not interested in is it is a kind of opportunity for Michael and I to whine about our jobs, which really isn't the case. Being a pastor is a great job. Uh, being a pastor has so many wonderful aspects. But I think as those who are charged with some type of leadership, some measure of leadership, there are always difficulties that come with that. There are hurdles, there are challenges. And I think the idea here is for us to look specifically at some of the challenges of the church, some of the things that the church seems to have to consistently try to navigate in order to move forward. And it is difficult. This is a tough time for churches to make progress. Uh, It is not a friendly environment in the culture at large right now for mainline Presbyterian type churches. And so as we continually struggle to move forward, and as those who are involved in the leadership level of trying to figure out what that means, there are some things that seem particularly challenging. And, you know, Michael, you and I have had this conversation before. There there are a lot of pastors who I think if you listen to them, almost kind of feel sorry. It, it, they treat pastoring as if it's some monumentally difficult task. And all jobs that you try to do well are difficult, and everyone's job has challenges. Everyone's job has difficulties. Everyone has aspects of their job that they wish weren't a part of it. And, and I think pastoring is no different. This is an opportunity, I think, for you and I through our lens, hopefully in a lighthearted way, to share some of those things because we believe they affect not just the way we do our job. They affect the church, and they affect the church's ability to grow, to learn, to serve, and to follow Christ faithfully. And and I think ultimately that's the important thing. It's not about it's not about the things that you and I find frustrating. It's about the things that have the potential of getting in a way in the way for our Christian community and our faith family. I'm sure you've had this happen, Clint. I know that I've had it happen numerous times. A person makes what is always intended to be 
a uh, a joke. It's it's for humor. But they'll make a comment, something about uh, how being a pastor is a job that you have for one day a week. Isn't that great, pastor? That you've got a job that you only need to show up on Sunday. And I- I've never had that said to me seriously. It's always been in form of joke. But there is though un. Uh, unspoken, this kind of idea that the bulk of the church's work happens on that one day a week. It's certainly the most visible. And so what may be surprising as we go through this series is how many of the church's struggles are actually built into the day-by-day functioning of the church. The stuff that every church does on some level has within it both the potential to be gracious and invitational and challenging And it also has the capacity for smallness and for arrogance and for judgmentalism and for all of the things that we seek to diminish for the sake of lifting up the thing that matters. And ultimately, that's not just the practices that matter. That's the, the one who matters. That's Jesus Christ, keeping him at the very center of our community. Um, you know, what I think is interesting about that is that it is a, day by day kind of job, no matter what you think the pastor's role is, the the people who sit in that role, um, that is the role of the entire congregation in our many different giftings, you know, whether that be a thing that you do through your study participation, through your service in the leadership of the church, through your participation in the mission and the the work and the service of the church, uh, you know, This is a very broad conversation, and I think it does land on each of us, though maybe, Clint, we come to it with a particular kind of day-in, day-out kind of vantage that not everyone shares. Yeah, I don't know if it will be an interesting opportunity for people to maybe get a glimpse of the church through the eyes of the people who spend the most time here, but that's kind of the idea, that's kind of our hope. And I think one of the things that may surprise people is pastors, in my experience, personal and somewhat professional with in terms of conversations with other pastors, we are rarely bugged by the big stuff. It is the little stuff that tends to weigh you down and wear you down. It, it's not the big mountain that you have to climb occasionally. It's the little bumps you go over day in and day out, those are the ones that I think really kind of wear people down. And and I don't think that's true just in the pastorate, Michael. I think that's true in in all jobs. There are some challenges that are, are sort of invigorating. You 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 get excited about trying to solve a problem. You get but but then there's that chatter that goes with it, the deadlines and the this thing and the that thing. And I think that small stuff um, often takes the wind out of our sails. The other thing that we want to say on the front end is that these frustrations that we may give voice to in the next couple of weeks are not exclusive to the congregation, neither in this place nor in general. In, in other words, some of the things that we may list as challenges, we wrestle with them personally. It, it is not a, an us versus them kind of thing, a, a you versus us kind of thing. These these are challenges we all face, and they get in our way as pastors, as well as in the way of church members and parishioners. And so um, we in no way, shape, or form think that we're looking in on this as neutral observers from the outside. That's not the case. Oh, I would even add to that. Um, it's not limited to one congregation. I don't think we're talking necessarily with a uh, address on the label to First Presence Spirit Lake, the, the place where we have the privilege to serve. I mean, I think both in engagement in other congregations, conversations with other pastors that serve in other places, and I would even take that another level to say some of the institutions and machinations that happen above the congregational level, whether that be in denominations or affiliations or, or whatever that looks like, uh, the temptations that happens very visibly, sometimes very practically, on the church congregational level exist at the higher level of the organized church as well. So uh, this isn't intended to be in any way uh, directed. Uh, it's, it's rather a reflection upon patterns. Um, sometimes I think when you see a thing happen enough times, you begin to wonder, I wonder if that is a rhythm or if that has a sort of thread that goes through it. 
And, um, I, you know, I think our topics here, for, for good or worse, um, I think our reflection of some items that we've seen in the past, talked about in the past, has having that kind of uh, thread that, that strands through them. Yeah. Threads through them. Yeah. And I, one of the blessings of being in this place, Michael, is that I, I think I could say with pretty clear conscience that most of the things that bug me as a pastor don't necessarily bug me here. They, they're often outside the context of First Presbyterian Church. Now, it's not to say that they don't show up here on occasion. They do because we're all human. But I think most of my deepest frustrations with church don't have to do in particular with this church. And, you know, for that, I'm grateful. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And so I think that uh, really maybe just helps us transition straight into the topic. Uh, we certainly um, want to sort of flesh out a little bit what this looks like. So today uh, we, we titled this as a working title, uh, Our Favorite, and then in parentheses, our least favorite idols. And, uh, you know, Clint, I just want to maybe say at the front end of this, I grew up thinking that idols was the stupidest thing. Um, you know, I read the Bible a lot as a kid, and uh, when you read the Old Testament and you see, like, golden calves and uh, people uh, burying things in their tent, um, and then that later being found, you know, stealing stuff from pagan temples, uh, you know, to a kid's mind, that's like just foolish, right? Like if if you believe in God, why would you want to have all these graven images? I mean, if you know if God has called you, why isn't that good enough? Um, it only takes a little while uh, with mature eyes to look around us and to see uh, how very apt, how very wise, how very discerning uh, the biblical authors are to show us the human propensity to idol making. Instead of thinking of idols as golden calves that people put on their mantles, which may be your, our temptation, if we think of idols as the things in our life that we make more important than they should be, then we suddenly entered into a realm in which that image of the idol-making aspect of the human heart becomes incredibly relevant, relevant for today. And uh, when you work in church and you work with people, the reality is that every single person, once again, us included on this list, every human is adept at creating idols. In fact, one of the core truths of idol making is that we don't even know we're doing it. I, I, I remember in Exodus when Moses comes down uh, and Aaron says, well, we threw in the gold, and the calf came out. Like, it just happened. I, that's what it seems like to us is that idol making just happens. And so whenever you work with people, and those people are often unaware of their own idols, but you see how those different commitments are becoming uh, very tenuous as people are trying to all sort of navigate together. It, it starts to become of supreme importance to understand what is the thing of highest importance, what are the things of lower importance that we've elevated, and, and then how do we navigate between them as a community of faith. You know, Michael, in, in some ways it would be much simpler if idols were a thing that sat on our mantle, that they could be that easily identified and that, you know, getting rid of them was a matter of just removing them from the shelf and putting them in the dumpster. But most of our idols reside um, in, in secret. They're in our hearts. They're in our minds. And oddly enough, we didn't set out to make them. Um, Typically, I think our experience of an idol is not that we wanted to create a false god. It was that we started to have good feelings about something, that we had good experience with something, and that over time we came to elevate its importance too highly. We, we came to put faith and trust and meaning in it and on it that it doesn't deserve and shouldn't have. And, and an idol is really nothing other than something we elevate that gets in the way of our faith, that gets in the way of following Christ. And so, uh, yeah, it would, it would be great if we just throw out the golden calves and that was the end of it. But I think um, far too often we don't really know what our idols are because they seem to us simply as good, important, and often 
as uh, extensions of our faith. And, and I think the first one that we could talk about is very much that I, if there is a most common idol that churches struggle with, in, in my experience, I, I think we'd have to at least suggest that it could be our church campuses, our, our buildings. We have loved our buildings, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Part of that is good stewardship. We've tried to manage and keep our buildings, but at times, churches have been far too attached to their sort of physical locations and, and everything that goes with that physicality. And we have at times treated being the church and having our building as one and the same. And, and the building then becomes a thing that gets in the way. It, be, it becomes a barrier because now we have this thing in the place we worship God but at times we almost seem to worship the thing itself or at least to, you know, kind of very much highlight the thing itself. And, you know, I, I don't think the history of the Christian church is short on examples of elevating our physical space to idol status. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And it doesn't take much looking into the Reformation to see how suspicious uh, the reformers were as to the power that space can have over us. In fact, they very famously went into many sanctuaries that today would would be considered artistic masterpieces. And they, uh, even then, uh, to great uh, controversy, went in and, and stole out this art, and they got rid of all of this uh, sort of beautiful architecture. And they said, you know, that the the sanctuary space should be plain, it should be a blank canvas upon which uh, we can then turn our attention away from the physicality of the thing to the spiritual presence of the one who really matters. That that was the heart behind their action, whether or not they achieved that or not, you know, we can leave that to the, theologians and, and historians. But I uh, think the point for today is to say, uh, that while we consider the power that buildings have upon our spiritual formation, it would be foolish, really, honestly, immature, to not just admit uh, the place where we have our children baptized, the place where our wedding has been held, the place where we have buried our loved ones, uh, the place where we have been week after week, um, this is going to naturally, because we are humans, become an important place in our life. The same way that uh, our home would or the family uh, you know, farm or whatever that kind of central place for you might be, um, that is going to become a a beautiful kind of pattern that gets fashioned into our life. The danger is when we allow that place itself to become the meaning. It, instead of it being a conduit, a vessel for the Christian body to gather for these beautiful moments of life, sometimes very hard moments of life to be lived out, instead of it being that, it becomes rather a kind of physical museum, a thing that we need to protect or that we need to wall off, a thing that uh, we need to resist change. Th those are maybe some of the initial signs that the space has gone from being a conduit of our communal life to rather a fixture unto itself. And, and that is where we are at least in danger, um, if not having crossed the line into idolatry. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting observation, Michael. Essentially, that the place in which we encounter the sacred, we are tempted to believe is the sacred. And when we stand in a sanctuary and we've had meaningful experiences and we've had growth, we begin to treat that space as if it is the thing that makes it sacred rather than the one who shows up, inspires us, meets us there and comforts and challenges us. You know, I recently heard a story about uh, two small churches of different denominations who decided they would uh, try to partner. And so they would take turns worshiping in the, each other's building on and off. And there was a small contingent of people from each church who wouldn't go to worship on the Sundays it was in mm -hmm. the other church, that, mm -hmm. that, that they were so committed, they were so stubborn about their quote-unquote building 
that they wouldn't go to the other place and worship there, even though this church had decided together, collectively, these two communions were going to try and become a community, a family of faith together. And yet within that, there were people who said, well, I will only go to the things that happen in, quote unquote, my building. And, and you know, there's a sadness to that. We, when we care more about the place than what happens in the place, then I think we have to raise this idle question. We have to ask some serious, difficult questions about um, where we are and whether that's healthy. You know, I think one of the New Testament stories that is certainly very challenging is the story uh, when Jesus goes to the temple and uh, he points out the kind of money and power and prestige that's being held over the people coming to worship. And he very critically uh, praises that action. And, you know, for the people of Israel, the temple being available to them, that, that very building had a kind of uh, historic connection as their own people, a kind of hope for what may come in their own restoration in the future. And when Jesus predicts that it's going to be tore down and destroyed, and of course that later comes to be in 70 AD, I, I think we discover even in Jesus's life and ministry that he resisted that temptation that people had to make it the place of the encounter with God instead of the actual encounter of God, that Jesus himself was the living tabernacle and any other physical tabernacle that we might call our place of worship, it is merely a contingent or a passing or a created place. But that, that should never become a substitute for the one true one who we encounter, whether in that place or not. If, if you cannot conceive of, if I cannot conceive of, our Christian worship happening alongside the riverbank or, you know, under the trees like the early church, you know, when they met in the catacombs and fear of being found, that there was no stained glass. There was no pew. There was no pulpit. There's no table. Now, we're grateful for all of these things. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'm not advocating that we should leave these things behind as if that would fix our idol making. Friends, we'll find a new idol. But we, I think, do need to become aware and intentional that we aren't making one thing a particular focus in our faith development. If you find yourself really anxious or really angry or really frustrated about one part of the building or one one specific aspect of its care or, you know, if, if that's it, and I'm not saying that you're wrong. You may be 100% right, but the problem with idol making is we always think we're right. So it's the stepping back to ask, from what is this motivated? And if we discern within ourselves with, with true, humble, and honest reflection um, that there's any form of kind of self-driven narrative or kind of focus upon the thing as opposed to the community, then that's a moment I think that we should all step back and prayerfully ask just for some perspective as we're seeking to, to make it about the one who saves and not the place where we seek to encounter him. Yeah, so church historians point out that in about 325, 313 AD, Christianity becomes legal. 325, we have the Council of Nicaea. In the, in the aftermath of that, the church, which had had no buildings, had met in secret, met underground, they begin to come above board and they begin building cathedrals. They become begin building churches. And when that happens, looking back, you can see very much their mission flagged evangelism flagged. Some of the lifeblood that had sustained the church up till that moment now became focused on their physical spaces. And it is an incredible blessing to have a physical space, but there is a challenge that comes with it. I read a story um, years ago, a, a beautiful story. There was a church in the South, I believe a Baptist church, that was hit by a tornado. And that tornado happened on Saturday night. And on Sunday morning, the people went and standing where their old sanctuary used to be, they surrounded their foundation of their building. Someone brought a guitar and they had worship. Their building was gone. But rather than say, we, we have nothing now, we can't be the church, they said, we're going to be church in a new way until we have a building again. And I, I think... 
you know, th- that's a lot to live up to. I think that's a really strong example of th- that the church should not take its buildings for granted, neither should it rely on them. And um, yeah, we've, we've been tempted to do both of those things in our history, and we try to navigate that. I think the same would be true of our kind of next thing on the list, Michael, which is essentially money budget in the church, uh, not money in general, culturally, but specifically in the church. And I, I think, uh, interestingly, this one can get us on both sides. This one can get us when we have lots of money and we're doing really well and we don't want to spend it and we want to have a certain amount and we want to have security. And it's sort of easy to see how that could take our focus. Ironically, though, it also happens when the church is struggling and everything becomes about the budget. Every conversation is about, can we afford this? Can we do this? And the budget begins to move front and center into the church's goals, into the church's... So being church becomes in that season about, can we meet budget? And when that happens, it's a negative idol. But it, it does become an idol in the sense that we become obsessed with it and, and everything else seems to seek to serve that goal. And so this is a tricky one because I think we can experience it both in wonderful times of blessing and in times that are lean, and we can get distracted in both. Right. Well, a, a budget is fundamentally difficult because it it puts in quantitative numbers a reflection of the values of those who hold it. Um, Whether that has been deeply thought through and processed or not, it's always a reflection of values. And when a church budget is uh, out of whack, when when it begins to have an undue influence in the church in either direction, I think what begins to happen is values that should remain at the periphery, not that they are unimportant. And I want to be very clear about that. There's some things that the church needs to do, and it needs to do them well. There's some administrative tasks, like, for instance, the, 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 the counting of money, the keeping of money, the accurate reporting of taxes to to its members. I mean, all of this matters, both within the congregation, but also to our local community, to our, our state, to our nation. These are people that we report all of these things too. We should do these uh, with integrity and transparency. That's important. But if we make that process unto itself of undue importance, then it becomes the source and function of the church as opposed to a group of people who are called by Christ, equipped by Christ, outside of their own comfort for the service to others and for the sake of inviting them to participate in God's best in the world. You know, that is where I think this idol frame may come to help us. It's that there's really nothing, to use Paul's language, there, there's really nothing that is not allowable. We're, we're free as Christians to partake in all of God's good things. And so as people who try to be good stewards of the resources that we've been given, you know, I think budget is one where we often get off track because it it is important. And it's not to deny that. It's that we... Uh, Im- imbue it with too much importance or a kind of importance it doesn't deserve. And when that happens, our theology becomes hijacked by the necessity of the moment, whatever we perceive that to be. And then that has a way of, over the, the long haul, uh, taking away from us the very heart of the Christian gospel, Jesus Christ, the one who's transforming us, and it rather becomes... Uh, you know, somewhat of a staid kind of conversation about what can we and can't we do because of the numbers. Right. And that's when I think we see on both ends, Michael, churches that are doing well budget-wise and churches that aren't, it, it becomes about us. It becomes about our needs, our wants, and, and our sense of what is enough and what should we do. And And in both instances, it sort of pushes the church to focus inwardly, which is very close to the definition of idolatry when we take our focus off of our larger mission and purpose in the world, and we begin to look only at ourselves. And budgets can clearly do that, as can our next topic, which is, I suppose, 
maybe success would be a good overall. Maybe sometimes in the mainline church, in the Presbyterian church, I think we experience it as kind of attendance or or bodies. You know, we we have been in the Presbyterian church nationwide. We've really been on a period of decline for a long time, and so. There are times we're tempted to just do anything that would bring people in. Right. right? It doesn't matter. Let's let's if it's Starbucks and and muffins, if that would anything that will get people here, let's do it. And and the people who aren't here essentially become the idol. The idea of attendance, the idea of outreach. And and I let me be clear, having people come to church is beautiful. Outreach is one of our fundamental tasks that we're called to do as Christians. And yet when it becomes about that, when it becomes about the number that we write down weekly of how many came to church, then attendance becomes the idol. It it no longer serves the greater purpose of our mission to the world. It becomes, again, about us. We used to have X number of people, and now we have X plus 10. And and as soon as we do that, I, I think we're on the wrong track. I think that, you know, that it, it, it's dangerous thinking. It, it, yeah, it is. And yet it seems, Clint, I think, to be such important thinking mm. because yeah. we identify that in, in the moment, in, especially in which we mm. see less people, we identify that as a reflection upon our value, upon our purpose, that, that we are failing which I want to be clear, every church needs to honestly evaluate every part of our ministries. There, there are maybe places where we're not succeeding or we're, where we're failing to invest in the right thing or we've uh, over uh, invested in the wrong ministry. You know, that, uh, there are lots of very nuanced conversations that I think wise Christians should have uh, as they seek to be faithful. But Clint, the danger of using those numbers is to think that they mean something that they don't, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that a small group of Christians can't be faithful is false. You don't need to be huge to be doing what you've been called to do. Uh, You you don't need to have a massive facility and a ministry that reaches around the world to be making a substantial difference for the kingdom. That's what we turn to when we look to Paul's theology of the oneness of the body, right? There are many different gifts, hands, feet, uh, you know, and of course, many sermons about the spleen and the, and the heart and the guts, right? You know, uh, how preachers try to make that applicable, right? But not every congregation can serve every population. Not every group of disciples can uh, be the place for every disciple. So there's a great gift in our plurality the lie that we believe, if we believe that less numbers by definition mean something, is that we have invested meaning in the number as opposed to the calling that comes to us by Jesus Christ. And I want to be clear, you know, uh, I do believe that the church uh, in its DNA does grow when we're invitational, when we show uh, the world what it means to be people of character. That that has a way of inviting others to partake. So it's not that numbers don't help us. It's not that they're not a tool that could be useful. But Clint, the line from a tool to a thing that we are obsessed with or driven by is a very thin line, and the church is always tempted to cross it. Yeah, I mean, this, the story of the church, Michael, is growth. And, and I would say even the call of the church is growth. But when growth becomes the primary goal instead of a byproduct of faithfulness, when growth is not the result of what we're doing yeah. in service to the gospel, but it is its own thing, and, and we are then tempted to say, well, whatever brings people in must be good. And we're also tempted to say that that large congregation must be faithful because people are going to right. it. And, and when we do that, and, and that's not jealousy, there are some beautiful, wonderful large congregations, but there are also 80,000 people that attend the Super Bowl, and that has nothing to do with faith. So it, it, crowds do not verify faithfulness. All we can do is to say, as we seek to practice the gospel, the Spirit will make room for people to want to be a part of that and, and will draw people to it. And when we treat growth as its own thing, and, and I, I would say a, 
sort of byproduct of this, Michael, this was huge in maybe the, oh, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s. There was this movement of young adult ministry, which was wonderful because we realized, hey, young adults and their families aren't coming back to church the way we hoped they would. But for a while, every conversation about church became, do you have young adults there? How many young adults do you have? Do you have a young adult service? Do you have small groups for young adults? And, and we almost sought to measure faithfulness in a congregation by how many 30-year-olds were there. Hmm. And, you know, again, should a church be a place that is reaching out to 30-year-olds? Without a doubt. There is no question. But should the church use a 30-year-old as the barometer of how faithful it's being? No, because that's one measure among hundreds, and it's not sufficient. And so I, I, there are just lots of ways that we can get off track when we pay it too much attention to attendance, to membership, to, to size, to growth. Um, if we don't keep that in its proper perspective, then I think it becomes the cart in front of the horse. And when that happens, uh, I, I, I just think, you know, we, it's going to create some problems. Full disclosure, uh, per what we talked about in the beginning of this conversation, uh, I, I do think pastors are particularly, I, I do think there is temptation towards buildings and budgets, especially when those things aren't working, right? Sure. If your toilet doesn't flush, that becomes a problem that needs fixed. When uh, you don't have the money to pay for the services that the church needs. That becomes a massive problem. But Clint, uh, correct me if you disagree with this, but I feel like the body's number is a particular temptation for lots of pastors. That's a thing I hear a lot, uh, you know, even sometimes in that introduction of, you know, I'm a pastor at this church. We're we're a church of this, this number, uh, you know, and generally the bigger the better. Um, so maybe of, of the things we discussed this far, maybe it, it seems in my experience at least that, that pastors um, share this particular temptation. Yeah, I've, I've joked before that at pastors' conferences, you know, the, the primary question is, you know, what, what's your name and how big is your church? And my temptation is always to say, oh, about a million. You know, just, <laughs> it, it, just becomes, it just becomes this thing that it shouldn't be. And, and I, I do want to back up, Michael. I, I want to say this again. I just want to insert this. Buildings, budgets, bodies, those are all great things. We don't make idols out of things we don't love. Yep. We don't make idols out of bad things. We make idols out of good things. We make idols out of important things that we care about. Those are the things that we have to be on guard. You know, something that we hate and don't want to do is never going to be our idol. Right. It, it just isn't. Being poor is never going to be our idol. It, 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 we, we simply elevate things that are good and we make them overly good in our own eyes. And so, yeah, that, that's very true of attendance and bodies. And I think you're right. Pastors are, pastors are probably more prone to that than congregations. Pastors, um, there's a lot of self-affirmation. There's a lot, there's just a lot of stuff that goes into that. And um, by extension, you know, that sort of goes to programs as well. Um, this one I would say is partly pastors, you know, when pastors talk, do you do this? Do you do that? We have this kind of thing. We have that kind of thing. But it's also churches are very prone to idolize the things they have always done. And sometimes it can be very difficult for churches to navigate the transition of not doing a certain thing anymore and moving on to do other things. And th those can be painful moments for churches because people have often invested time and effort and, and passion into those ministries. But there comes a time when those things simply aren't working in the same way anymore. Time has changed, culture has changed, and, and churches struggle in those moments not to elevate the past and, and be sort of overly attached to what was done just because it's when things were going really well and it's when I felt good and it's when I was connected. And I, and I think that is a, I, I think that's a common temptation. You know, I think that is a particular truth from our 
advantage. Mm. So as Presbyterians who are part of a mm-hmm. mainline church like the Methodists or the Lutherans, I think that is 100% accurate. I think from a different vantage, there are churches who every six weeks, they completely redo their stage. They put, yeah, and that's what they would call it, that they put, you know, big decorations and they, they throw stuff away and they bring new stuff in. I think there's a competing temptation by some churches to glorify the future and possibility, like the idea we need to just get rid of stuff all the time so that we can keep people interested. That, I think, is the opposite side of the exact same coin. Whenever we essentially put our experience and our desire for something that we think was good or could be good, and we make it the focus of our attention, then fundamentally what we've done is we made it about our own opinion as opposed to a living encounter. And there's some wisdom in having some old things that remind us of the storied connection to the historic faith. You know, there's something deeply beautiful about having that foundation uh, you know, that footstone that, that has the year that the congregation was planted to remind you of the passion of the people who said we need to be faithful followers of Christ. It's another thing when we surround that with, you know, the red museum tape and uh, we say don't touch, you know, stay away kids from the, from the church, from the sanctuary. I, it, it's a very vibrant kind of living, messy middle of being church that recognizes we both need to have the best of what we have done, um, but also an awareness that all of the best of what we did have was for the purpose of serving Jesus Christ in that moment. And so anything that no longer serves that purpose for those disciples gathered today, then simply just needs to be retooled or reimagined, or it needs to find a new way to live itself out because the best things of the past always spoke to Christ. And so the best things of the present will do the same. And that is painful work because of our investment, because of how much we put into it. In some cases, how much we loved it. I think that's a a helpful comment, Clint. There is legitimate grief sometimes in church when we realize that we might need to change a thing for the sake of our fellowship, our community, our, our whole body. But that's a sacrifice we're always making, like in a marriage or parents and and their children or friends. You know, every relationship requires a give and take, and it requires a kind of flexibility to grow. So the same in the church. Yeah, I think, think again, I I think you're on to something, Michael. In in our experience of that as Presbyterians, I, I think it tends to be more centered in the past. You know, I read a really interesting quotation recently that said, churches are dangerous when they care more about their past than their present. And you could, I think you could reasonably insert future. Churches are dangerous when they care more about their future than their present. But in the Presbyterian experience, I think we live in the the past sense of that quote. You know, most Presbyterian churches used to be bigger than they are now. They used to do more than they do now, and they miss those days. And they think that if they can just get a couple more years out of the, you know, the annual coat drive or the, the Christmas tree giveaway or whatever it was that they did, that maybe it will come back because they don't just miss that thing. They miss the experience of being the congregation who was able to do those th- things. And, and it, is a, it is a sense of loss, but the, the idol in that is to forget. We begin to worship the past. We begin to uh, idolize what we used to do instead of saying, what are we going to do right now with who we are now? Not who we were, because we're not who we were anymore, but who are we right now and what does God want to do in us and through us in this moment? How can we plug into our community in some new way that we haven't done before? How can we grow as a church deeper or larger or whatever growth that looks like as who we are in this particular moment? And I think, you know, sort of being stuck in the past keeps us from those conversations and, and by definition then keeps us from growth. 
Uh, just a very, very briefly, I won't belabor this. I, I think that this is relevant not just to congregations, but actually to entire denominations. Mm-hmm. And I think the way that this looks for denominations looks like a kind of longing for yesterday's influence and yesterday's importance. That's, this is especially too, true for mainline denominations who remember a day, you know, maybe 50 or 60 years ago when uh, their voice was sought after uh, in the public discourse. In some cases, a politician could be made by what denominations they said they were a part of or uh, the kind of edict that a group of denominations made could have substantial impact in sort of a cultural imagination. And those days, if we're going to be honest, are largely behind us. A lot of that sort of cultural influence which, if we were going to be reflective, some was good, and and certainly there was some that was not, um, has certainly diminished. And so because of that, I think there's a kind of longing for that old day when the denomination had a kind of influence and power and cultural attention that no longer has. That unto itself, I think, uh, breeds uh, distraction at best. Uh, At worst, it's a complete sort of diversion from the the task that the church is called to be. And that is not a a place where influential people gather, but a group of people who gather under the only influence that matters, and that is Jesus Christ. So it's an inversion of what we're called to be as Christians if we put our emphasis upon our earthly power as opposed to God's power. And and to be fair, I think much of that is um, probably rose-colored nostalgia as opposed to you know, pure historical fact. But I think it functions at a much higher level than just the congregation is my point. We had in our denomination a moderator for many years named Marge Carpenter. And Marge had this well-known litany that she began her speeches with. And she and it was this refrain, I'm proud to be a Presbyterian. In fact, I think she would sometimes say, I'm sinfully proud to be a Presbyterian. And then she would, from there, go on to narrate how many presidents had been Presbyterian, how many governors, how many astronauts, how many Supreme Court justices, how many whatever, you know, award-winning people, Olympic-level athletes, and, and this litany of how many great Presbyterians we've had. And it was interesting. It was even compelling. I mean, it, it, I guess it made you feel good. But I remember hearing that as a 20-year-old thinking, well, where are they now? Mm. And well, what? Mm. So what? Well, I mean, right. that, it's great that we've had that wonderful history, but what does that mean to look forward? What? what why are we... Does it really matter who's been a Presbyterian? Let's talk about what we're going to be. I, and and I'm, not, I'm not criticizing Marge, beautiful, wonderful lady and a, and a very competent leader. But I always thought it was interesting that that was the measure of what it meant to be proud as Presbyterians, that we had had all of these important members in bygone ages. And... Uh, it, I don't know. It, I was a little skeptical. I think wherever we become tempted for it to be a good reflection on us, hmm. we have walked into very dangerous territory. Now, there are moments in which I think the church does need to pursue character and pursue uh, a ref- uh, seek to to root out the weeds in our garden because we're called to be the kind of people who reflect the, the fruits of the Spirit, right? And, and so there is a kind of, I guess, an awareness, uh, an outer awareness in that. Um, but it's not chiefly about what other people see. That's the, that's the short road to hypocrisy. It's rather a, an honest and heartfelt desire for the, the Spirit to transform us and to work within us this kind of conversion that that will continue until the day that we take our last breath or, or we're taken up in, in the sky to meet Jesus, whatever happens first. I think the temptation that lives in our individual hearts 
lives in our congregations and it lives in our gatherings of congregations. And it is this desire to tell a story of who we are that looks more like a painting than it does look like reality. And we have no need to brush up the church. Jesus Christ died for sinners. So we don't need to put uh, makeup on to be good enough for Jesus. I, I think instead it's a matter of being honest about who we are right now and then seeking to allow through the day-by-day kind of discipleship that happens in our congregations and in our personal lives uh, for that to then transform us. That may actually be the road to influence that, that some people long for, Clint, but not an influence from the top down, but an influence of deep character and sort of uh, uh, the, the kind of influence of those who would want to follow someone who has found the wholeness of Jesus Christ, as opposed to, uh, you know, people who just have a lot of letters behind their name or, or great success in their past life. Yeah, and in, in fact, Michael, I think, you know, one of the cautions of, you call it top down, one of the cautions in that for the church is that in many congregations, the pastors themselves have been idols. It, the, the church becomes a reflection of the pastor's ego, of the, the pastor's giftedness. And um, there, there are many congregations that have allowed themselves to sort of become tied into service of the pastor rather than Jesus. And, uh, you know, that's a particular warning, I think, to congregations, not to elevate its, its own leadership too highly. Um, that, that's not always the fault of the pastor, though the pastor always bears some of the fault. But a, a congregation has to be careful not to elevate a person above their status as well. And then, you know, ultimately, that's true of all of us. We, we have to be sure that we're working not to put ourselves in the center, in the middle, our, our own opinions. You know, one of our great idols is my opinion. And I think, you know, you and I would... We join everyone firmly in that, that that the idea that I want this place to be a place that serves what I think and, and what I want, that I want this place to be a reflection of my own needs, of my own desires, of my own wishes and thoughts on what is best and what should happen. And when we do that, we make an idol out of the church itself. And, you know, it, it, that's dangerous. I want to speak carefully here, but I do think in the present moment in which we live, Clint, this is particularly relevant. When we live in a time where one's affiliation with a group of any kind reflects a certain kind of acceptance of any range of ideas. In other words, if if you're a Democrat, it means you believe all these things, or a Republican, the same, or I'm a conservative of this stripe, it means this, or I'm a, I think in some cases this applies these days to sports teams. I'm a fan of this sports team, so that means that I think this about all of these things. I, We live in a time that is so polarized. There's so much push to edges that what happens in the midst of that is we baptize people's opinion. Uh, we say, well, because I think this, I'm unwilling to entertain a conversation with someone who thinks someone else because they are a, put a label on it. They're a that, they're a that, they're a that. And because they're that, we know that there's no help for them. I, the, the reality is that Jesus Christ came for the salvation of all. Now, we don't know the mysterious way that God is making that work out in the world, and, and, and that's not for us to figure out. But it is to say, Jesus' entire ministry in a reading of the four Gospels makes it clear he was preaching a more expansive kingdom than the religious leaders of the day were able to understand. And I think that for Christians gathering in Christian community, that doesn't mean that we're all wrong. It doesn't mean that everything we think is just our opinion and therefore uh, it, it doesn't matter. Of course not. Uh, there are things that we think and believe that are true and helpful, but that will not be found. We cannot, I would argue strongly, we cannot discern the difference between opinion and truth without a gathered body of disciples. I mean, that is a, a, a very strong reformed 
uh, commitment that comes all the way back from the Reformation and before to the historic faith that that no bishop should be the one who determines the faith for all the church. That should be done in council. That should be done in conversation. That's where we get this word discernment. It happens together. And that is going to require us to be able to name our own opinion. Opinion is not a bad word. It, it, in fact, being able to name this is my opinion can sometimes be the most helpful starter to a conversation. But if we can't name it, then the uh, then the obvious temptation is that we've taken our opinion and we've made it truth that we expect everyone to see the exact same. And if that's the case, Clint, uh, that can make it very difficult to navigate as a Christian body. Yeah, Michael, I, th- I think that whenever we feel compelled to modify the word Christian, I'm a conservative Christian, I'm a liberal Christian, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, I'm a fundamentalist Christian, I'm a progressive. When, whenever we feel the need to put a modifier before the, the word that means Christ follower, we have to be very cautious that that word doesn't point toward something we're in danger of idolizing. Uh, an agenda item. It is not that those words are bad. It is not that Bible believing is some kind of knock. It, It is not. But when we feel compelled to elevate that label, conservative, liberal, whatever, to the equality of Christian, then we're on thin ice. And we have to think seriously about what do we understand that modifier to mean to us and to others? And in what way could it be a barrier to that primary word, Christian, which is ultimately the only thing that we are called to be, is followers of Christ. And Christ will determine how to modify that and modify us in that relationship And we have to be, I think, very careful with the idea that we need to add something to that for the benefit of self and others to locate ourselves on the spectrum. Uh, We we do not need to do that, in my estimation. As we as we make way to bring some conclusion to the conversation, I, I just think it's worth saying that as we reflect on the prevalence of idolatry as being human is really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Idolatry lives in every corner of the earth. Wherever there is a human, there's a temptation for idol making. This this is not just a church thing. This lives everywhere. Uh, But as we reflect on that, it's not to beat anyone up over it. It's not to say, hey, uh, look at these horrible idols, you, you, you. I mean, from the from the inside of that circle, you know, Clint and I, for, as we as we live inside of it, it's to say, it's not that idols are just bad or that they're theologically um, incorrect. It's rather that they stand in between us and the saving God. It, that we we take a thing that we have created or that we've made more important than it should be, and it sits in between us. And the God who is seeking to redeem and save us. And Jesus Christ is the only mediator. He's the only one that should ever be in the middle of anything. And we put stuff there. And whenever we do that, it's bad for us. It hurts us. It hurts our soul. It makes us more selfish. It makes our world too small. It makes us sick. It, it, it's not just a bad boy or, or bad girl. It's not like a sin thing. It's, it, Of course... You know, the church has a theological tradition that we can draw upon, but I I think the point I want to just make here is it's not about the idolatry that makes this conversation important. It's about the freedom that can live on the other side of it. If we're willing to give up the idol and allow Jesus Christ to be the one in the middle and not these things that we make more important than they should be, then we're more free as God's children to be grateful. We're more free to love. We're more free to embody the spiritual gifts that we all know would make our life more whole and full. That's the beautiful invitation here. Don't get caught up in any kind of, you know, judgmentalism, but rather be focused on the invitation by Christ to 
to uh, give away our own burden so that we might take his, to take his yoke instead of our own. And uh, they're easy words to say, granted, but if we're able to live in that practice day by day, uh, Sunday by Sunday, uh, friends, it will have an impact on our own lives and on the congregations that seek to worship and be faithful. Yeah, absolutely. Our idols do several things. They they weight us down. They distract us. They keep us from real growth and real progress. They do that as individuals, and they do that as congregations, as church communities. And so um, as we spot them, we, we certainly want to be on the lookout. And as we identify them or as we struggle with them, uh, we want to release them and move on so we can treat those things as the gracious gifts they are and not turn them into things that make it harder for us and others to follow Christ. Well, uh, friends, I think that will end this conversation for today. I hope you found it helpful. If there are things or questions that it raises, uh, we would love to engage that with you. Uh, drop a note in the comments, let us know, and we'll, we'll jump in there and have a conversation with you. Uh, if that's not comfortable, uh, we, you, of course, you'll find a link to the uh, form in our uh, description of wherever you're joining us here today. Share this with a friend. It's the beginning of a new series. If you think there's somebody who might find it interesting, uh, be sure to let them know that we're going. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week as uh, we jump into the next thing that uh, bugs pastors. Thanks for listening.